Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another BJCP-style uh, review session. I am Matt Miller from Craft Beer Nation. I've got a, a panel, a full panel here tonight. We've got a full room. Uh, we're going to talk about English pails. We're going to talk about Category 8 of the BJCP uh, guidelines, and we're going to talk about some fun, fun stuff. We've been talking about loggers, and I've really kind of grown my appreciation for loggers over the past seven categories, the eight weeks. And uh, But now we're going to move in towards uh, ales, which is... Uh, a little easier to come by with regards to the number of ales that are made versus the number of loggers, I would say. But uh, but this is th this first style here is one that's uh, uh, I'm a I'm a pale ale guy. So whether they're American pales or, or British pales, I love it. So I'm looking forward to tonight's conversation. Before I start, I got a couple of things to run through. We are Craft Beer Nation. You can find us on craftbeernation.org. O R G. And uh, we are a craft beer community on Google+. That's where all the fun stuff happens. That's where we all met, where we all share our pictures of what we're drinking and our, our review videos and all that kind of fun stuff. So check us out there. If you want to just listen, listen while you're driving down the highway. We are on Stitcher, iTunes, and the FeedBurner feed. So you can find us at all those kind of great places. So that's all that kind of junk. Now the panel tonight is um, uh, Gil Mello, Doug Nolan, Boris Castillo, Ashley Bauer, and Alan Huerta from... Craft Beer Nation, so we've got a, a good round-out group there, group there. We also have three highly experienced judges of the BJCP persuasion. We've got Phil Farrell. Phil, how are you tonight? Doing great. All right. We've got David Hausman, who's been here every week. We love David. He's full of knowledge. And we've got Agatha Feltis. Agatha is here about every other session, and, uh, and we love having her with us, too. How are you, Agatha? I'm great. Thank you. All right, so that that's the group. Most of us have a beer in our hand. So let's talk a little bit about English pails. Who wants to jump in and, and offer some information about maybe the history of this style or maybe even just why this style is different from the other styles, why it, why it exists in the way it does? <laughs> David. Dave, let's go. <laughs> oh, well, I guess, uh, yeah, I can start. I, I can't say... Um, I don't know why it exists, just that it does. I mean, it, it's, again, a style that's been brewed in the U.K. for a very long time, um, really popularized in the late 19th, early 20th century, um, when they really understood how to, uh, the water chemistry, how to make sure that they were using the water around Burton-upon-Trent. And it was the, the high sulfate, content of the water which it kind of accentuated the hot presence and created something uh, that was an alternative that was to what was being brewed at the time which was porters and it became kind of the thing. Um, these typically are lower gravity, lower alcohol beers basically to address the tax situation in the UK which basically um, uh, tax based on the malt that went into a the amount of malt that went into a I'll say a barrel or whatever the the size of the, the fermenter was at the time um, and so by making the lower alcohol beers it was lower tax rate available to the common man in the pubs they were uh, not very carbonated essentially they were served uh, out of firkins on uh, on draft with uh, pull either, I guess, frickin' setting up and just uh, opening the tap or uh, the hand pumps. And that's basically what you have. You have this beer that's uh, all called uh, bitter or uh, either ordinary bitter, special bitter, or extra special bitter. Um, they were more bitter than the beers at the time. They're not bitter by some of American standards in pale ales or IPAs, uh, so sometimes that's misinterpreted. Uh, but they are more bitter than the beers that were at the time. So, so this whole style or the styles here are common, commonly referred to as bitters. You know, let's have a pint of bitter. They typically mean uh, a light-bodied uh, pale ale, English pale ale. Uh, yes, a low gravity session beer. One of the things you stop at the pub and can have several of and still uh, walk home. Uh, probably not drive in the UK these days that way, but you would walk home and, and make yeah. it. Uh, <laughs> Unassisted. 
I was going to say, that's a, that's a little known fact, Dave, that the whole reason the Brits drive on the opposite side was they drank too much bitter, the beer got too strong, and that's what held them started. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I guess the word pale right there in there is what, uh, when I think pale, I think SRM, you know, I think, you know, you know, less than five, light in color, but that certainly isn't true when you get into the extra specials and, and some of the, and some of the other just pale ales, so uh, is that just a distinction of, of body, uh, you know? No, it, it, it really is, you got to think at the time when these styles originated, it was an alternative to what was really popular in London, which was the porters. And they were black beers. And so you have something that was uh, typically made with uh, uh, just a two-row malt and some crystal for color and body and mouthfeel. And so you had something that was far paler than the porters at the time. They were also more bitter than mm -hmm. the right. porters at the time. All right, so we need to we need to not consider it as a pale. Some place they even call pale malt beers as well, right? Yeah, I, I was, wanted to make a point. Uh, Dave um, was you know talked about the history and everything. Besides the water that you know created that accentuated bitterness, they really at at the time they were making brown ales and they were making porters, mm -hmm. but they were making it out of brown malt. With very little roasted, you know, character, um, they couldn't make pale malt. They had no way to kiln it, and it wasn't until, as time went on, they went from wood-fired kilns to gas-fired kilns to charcoal, you know, those types of things. As they advanced in that, they were able to make pale malt. But prior to the pale malt being able to be made, they uh, they weren't able to, you know, produce this type of beer, the pale beer. The other thing too was somewhere. When somebody decided, hey, let's drag the hydrometer into a uh, brewery because that was almost forbidden. You know, you always did things the uh, traditional way where people would just look and that looked about right. They realized you know, they were getting a lot more extract out of the pale malt than they were out of the brown or the uh, darker malts that they were using. So, again, that was, uh, you know, just the way they, you know, as they industrialized the process, they got a lot more efficient making pale beers. Yeah, good points. Excellent yep. point. But really, the you know the word pale can be, it, it's a matter of subjection, right? I mean, if I'm comparing it to a stout, then it is very pale. If I'm comparing it to um, a BMC light lager, then not so much. So, Correct. Yeah. yeah. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Well, what what are some of the distinctions of the subcategories here? I mean, it really you know standard and ordinary. What are some of the what are some of the numbers that we look for here? What are some of the things that we that we that we try to find in that subcategory? Looks like um, <laughs> IBUs are twenty five to thirty five. SRM is four to fourteen, which to me there again just just kind of stops me in my tracks. Fourteen is a pretty dark for what I would have thought a pale ale would have been, but um, you know ABV is a three two to three eight, and that's a that's, that lands right in what we talked about earlier, that sessionable ale that says uh, this isn't going to be too expensive. It isn't going to it isn't going to keep you from walking home. Yeah, and, ordinaries are fantastic. So so really, and, and I'll tell you that I've traveled in the UK, and I know Phil probably is there frequently. The um, a lot of this was based on tax laws, and and there isn't a clear distinction between these, except as we've defined them in the um, um, style guidelines. the In the UK, it's up to a brewery that basically what is their special, what is their extra special. Uh, it tends to follow these guidelines. Don't think these were done in total uh, disrespect to what's there, but there isn't a clear demarcation between them. It's really a continuum. And so, you know, one brewery's could be at the high end of uh, ordinary bitter, and and the other could be at the the low end. Uh, uh, in color, you've got Boddington's that's very very light, mm -hmm. and you've got some uh, draft beers there that look like brown ales or uh, you know even the dark miles. So there is a quite a range, but in trying to 
delineate them for brewing purposes and in keeping with how the breweries tend to market things, we came up with, or not, we didn't come up with, but we've included in here the the three. The three. Um, the really distinctions based on body and mouthfeel, alcohol, bitterness levels, and sweetness levels. Um, Phil, Phil, jump in. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was going to say, um, there are other examples of that kind of way beers are delineated. Like, think of the Germans, the way, you know, you have a, a standard, you know, uh, strength of a lager, and then you have a Bach, and then you have a Doppelbach, and everything has to be very highly delineated. The Brewers Association does the exact same thing for a lot of their IPA categories and their ale categories, where they'll just say, okay, this is the range, boom, and they'll say this is the, you know, how we're going to delineate it for contest purposes. But just like Dave said, the breweries, you know, if they want to confuse their consumers, they're, they're free to do that, but for the most part, People consider, you know, an ordinary bitter to be something that's you know, pretty low in alcohol. You know, that you know, if it's even close to four percent alcohol, you're pushing the limits, and that's kind of what you know they're looking for. Something that, well, I can drink three, four pints stuff over the course of two or three hours and not have any buzz at all. I can throw darts, I won't hit somebody in the back of the head, you know, that type of thing. That's very for me when I and before, I always thought. The English pale ale were the extra special and strong beater. Those were the ones that I always related to the English pale ales. Never thought about the ordinary beater. And then as I start drinking more and more, you see, I start learning about it, but still they are so close to me. They, I don't see a lot of difference between those three sub styles profile wise. That's why I was hoping that I could get some of you guys tell a little more about that. Differentiation. Where do you find the big difference between those three subcategories? Well, what, one thing is that the term English Pale Ale, as in something like Fuller's or uh, or uh, Bass, is really this, the same as it's a bottled version in the sense of the extra special bitter. In other words, there's not really much of a delineation there, except typically bitter is served on draft. Um, very low carbonation l levels, whereas pale ales tend to be the bottled versions and a little higher carbonation. For home brewers, if you keg and you have a hand pump, it's easy to make an ordinary bitter. Uh, otherwise, what you're making by putting it in the bottle and carbonating it um, in the bottle is really a, a bottled version of a, of a bitter, and it's typically called a pale ale. You know, one, one thing you were mentioning there about, you know, how they're um, serving it and everything. Um, something else to consider, like when um, you were mentioning about its uh, 414 SRMs there, Matt, and it was, um, you're saying, well, that's a big spread. Well, things go through stages, and, you know, just in the short time I've been a home brewer, I've watched in England how they've gone from, you know, beers that are kind of heavily laden with uh, caramel malts, crystal malts, to now, the all the rage is the uh, golden bitters. So they're sitting there right around that four uh, SRM. They're yellow beers, and they're uh, you know they tend to be a little bit more hop forward, you know, and uh, they're not afraid to use citrusy American style or American like hops. So it's one of those things that you know where you'll go one place and you'll get the earthy hops, you go another place and you will get no kidding um, something they say. Wow, it's kind of a very light version of. Uh, Pale American ale. It's just, it's kind of surprising, but that's what they'll do. And the other thing too is that they travel poorly. They're terrible beers to travel. One of my good friends here does a cask ale. Um, it's true. And uh, so one year we uh, we were in London crowning the grand champion of British beer at the Great British Beer Festival. So he invited the brewery to send uh, you know a cask over for the uh, you know for his cask festival. And three and a half percent alcohol does not travel across the Atlantic very well. And we got this cask, and it was oxidized <laughs> in a bad way. It was not. It was in no way, shape, or form indicative of the style. It definitely was not delicious. Nobody drank it. They had one little sip and say, "Ooh, if this is what this is, I don't want any of it." 
Yeah, I was going to say, I think that the trend toward the, um, the lighter end of the ordinary bitter is kind of an attempt uh, by the breweries in the UK to compete with the fizzy yellow lager, mm -hmm. uh, which has become very, very popular. You know, you can get Stella Artois on tap in pretty much any pub in England. So it's, I think it's kind of an attempt to compete uh, with the light lagers, which have become so ubiquitous across the, the world. Um, Man, so they really kind too, of, That's really yeah. too bad. Yeah, because I love the kind of darker uh, caramel malt character that you can get in a really good uh, bitter. Uh, but, yeah, it is kind of tending toward that way. And the effect of the low carbonation is something that I think is very difficult to replicate in the bottle, kind of what Phil and David have kind of alluded to, which is if you get it at a pub in England, it's on a hand pull. The barmaid will have to pull as hard as she can on this, you know, on the pull to get it into your glass, and it'll have a sparkler uh, on the end of it, which is actually what gives it most of the head on it. Oh, it's really? not real. Yeah, it's actually it's not most. A, a forced aeration at the pump. Yes. Yeah. Huh. And actually, if you go to Scotland, there's only a couple of pubs up there. They have a version of that that is a called a Scottish beer engine, but it's actually uh, a pump that just pumps air into it so it goes <laughs> instead of them pumping on it. it it's hilarious if you can find there's only two pubs in Edinburgh I know of that actually still have Scottish beer engines but it's actually like a, a pressurized version of a hand pump it's very cool but yeah it it, it kind of gives this kind of creamy mouthfeel to it so instead of getting that sharp prickliness that you get from forced carbonation or really high levels of carbon dioxide they try to replicate that by having that little ball in the Boddington's uh, yeah. can that gives it the nitro. But, yeah, it, the mouthfeel is really important to this style, and that kind of low level of carbonation really, I think, kind of brings out the malty character as well. Yep. That was going to be one of the questions that we had here. Uh, we were talking about before we went on air, and I'm trying to remember if it was Ashley or Alan that talked about it. That was that was talking about you know in all these styles, and there's Boddington right there at the ordinary level with nitro, and you know what is it that nitro brings to that? And I guess Agatha just answered that, and that is um, it recreates a mouthfeel that is indicative of that style in the place that it's sold. I mean, is that really yep. what they're trying to do there? They're trying to kind of unsuccessfully, but if you it, think about the difference between having a can of Guinness that has the nitro ball in it and getting a bottle of Guinness that's actually forced carbonated with carbon dioxide, the ball is actually nitrogen, or, or what we call beer gas, which is a combination of nitrogen and carbon dioxide. Nitrogen forms smaller bubbles in solution, so it feels creamier, and it gives it that really tight, thick head. And, and, and what size what size bubbles would those aeration devices, the sparklers on the pumps, give? They're, oh, they're they're big. <laughs> oh, they're big bubbles. Yeah. yeah. Here's something to keep in mind: is uh, you know, beer gas is 75% nitrogen, 25% CO2 because CO2 keeps oxygen away from your beer. Mm -hmm. As you aerate it with a hand pump, air is 78% nitrogen. So that whole beer gas thing is a way to keep from oxidizing the beer, but at the same time give it that same mouthfeel like Agatha was talking about with the small, you know, itty-bitty nitrogen bubbles. That's why you get that cascade. That's the race between the small nitrogen bubbles and the bigger CO2 bubbles when you pour a Guinness, when you pour some of these other beers. But again, with a hand pump, there was, if you had a young beer sitting in the cellar and they were drawing it up with the hand pump from the cellar, there was a lot of residual CO2 because they would leave that open, otherwise there would be a vacuum created, so it would have to be open. Well, one way to keep it from oxidizing was if the beer was still young and there was still some yeast on it and it was still fermenting, you'd have a little bed of CO2 on top of it, and you could sit there, and that was to get those little prickly bubbles out of there. And as we'll all admit, you can drink a lot more liquid that doesn't have CO2 in it than you can with a beer that's highly carbonated. And, and nitrogen is not very soluble in liquid, well, at least in beer and water. Yep. And, and so even though you've got 75% nitrogen or 78% in the air, it's not being absorbed. And so all you're doing is, is um, uh, forming 
this this head in when you pop a can of mm -hmm. Guinness draft or or whatever and then there is no real residual gas underneath it or very little that's to pop the bubbles that form and that's why the head stays around uh, the gas bubbles form a head but they'll also break it down highly carbonated beer sometimes will the um, will break down the head that does form as a uh, additional gas is uh, given off well then so then the the lack of ability for nitrogen to stay uh, soluble in beer or in liquid mm -hmm. that's the reason that that nobody ever had carbonation in the second half of a Boddington's I've, I've had Boddington's time and time again and the the second half of that beer is flat all the time well it's 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 basically flat to start with because yeah. It, yeah. It's, yeah, but it's, but it's like oh, okay, I'm just gonna choke this down and get to the beginning of the next one. So <laughs> I should just pour them out and drink something else. But but let's let's go to the judging the style things here a little yeah. bit. And I think that's where uh, my compatriots here can jump in in terms of the the hopping rate. They should be they're bitter beers, but not overly assertive. They're kind of balanced. A little bit more hoppy than malty, but there's still a good malt backbone to these. The body is light, and all of those uh, the kind of goes from maybe medium from light medium to medium to medium light to to medium uh, as you go up in the strength. Um, the, uh, the smaller ones don't tend to have much in the way of hop aroma and flavor. Maybe a little something like. Uh, the woodiness of um, of uh, East Kent Goldings, for instance, would be elegant in these beers. Uh, Willamette is in a U U.S. version of it. Um, and then, uh, as you get bigger, the bigger beers, you may get more hop presence in the finish. Um, I do I know at least one brew pub in the U.K. that uses a lot of Cascades. Not traditional in the U.K., but it's a market. They're trying to differentiate themselves from every other pub. Mm -hmm. So they're using American hops. And so here, in these styles, we've kind of focused on these as being traditional UK. But in the real world, the marketing people are doing all kinds of things. Um, they tend to use um, primarily uh, uh, two row pale ale malt and some crystal. But a lot of the breweries still will use some brewing sugars, whether it's uh, uh, you know like raw sugar or, or uh, uh, I forget some of the the types. But it's typical, and it lightens the beer up a little bit. But they don't. It isn't like a Belgian where they're adding a lot of sugar after you know. Is uh, they're taking away some malt too, so they're still low gravity. You know. Mm -hmm. Well, the on the past they had. Much harsh water, hard water, helps helped to clear the beer as well in the past. Right, it was one of the things that helped well, beer to be a little calcium, clear. Calcium does help clear things. That's true. Mm -hmm. And the you know we ha we haven't talked about water a lot, but um, typically the water that was endemic in the kind of Burton on Trent area is both hard and has a lot of sulfate in it. So. Hard water tends to make the malt a little bit um, more intense flavor-wise, and sulfate intensifies the perception of bitterness. So even though there's not really a lot of hops in there, it is perceived as being more bitter than it is, simply because of the water profile. Mm -hmm. So then I, I guess I shouldn't have made a double imperial brown ale with Burton on Trent water profile hop. Huh? <laughs> well, yeah, if you want it hoppy. <laughs> well, you know, too much of a good thing you can end up, you know, with a, you know, sulfate accentuated hop bitterness. It can be harsh if mm -hmm. you go overboard. So you have to, you have to be a, have a light hand with that. And yeah, I think what Dave was talking about before, even though you have a limited palate, there's quite a few little colors you can throw in with these beers as far as how much ester, uh, you know you're going to allow in there, you know, where you're going to have the hops come out, um, the different malts and sugars you might use, the lightener, you know, give a, you know, um, just like with the Belgian beers, uh, the sugars that the English will use for their beers, a lot of times add character to the beer. You know, it may be some kind of uh, 
carbonado sugar or something like that. It's not just a simple sugar to get alcohol and you know keep on pressing like that. Yeah. So I think um, they do a really nice job of making the beers very elegant, very complex without being overpowering in any way, shape, or form. And that's what's nice about when they're really well done. It's just like, wow, I had a lot of beer there for something that was so simple. Yeah, it's like drinking a really good mild. You'll never know that you're drinking something that's, you know, less than 3.5% alcohol, right? Yeah. So if I want to taste a beer that would be a good beer for the style, would Fuller's be, would you consider Fuller's to be kind of a true to the style, or it's a hard thing to say? Well, it depends on which one you're going for, right? I mean, Filler's Chiswick Bitter was, I think, Michael Jackson, the beer hunter's favorite beer of all time, if I'm remembering this correctly. You cannot get it on this side of the ocean because, to Phil's point, it does not travel at all. And actually, I've been on the Fuller's tour, and they refuse to export it for that very reason. Yes. Um, I personally like Adnum's Bitter, which is the second uh, on the list for the standard ordinary bitter. I think it has a, it's on the darker end, uh, to Matthew's point. It's closer to the 14 SRM, and it has a much stronger caramel malt character to it. So if you can find that one, I like that one quite a lot for the standard ordinary bitter. Boddington's is not a, a fantastic example because it's got that nitro ball in it, and it's very, very pale uh, for the style, even. And Green King IPA, which is on the list here, to somebody who was making the point earlier that some of this is kind of a marketing tool. There's a lot of things which are labeled as IPAs, British IPAs, which are actually bitters, because they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No, it's like going to Belgium. If you ask for a uh, dark, strong in Belgium, they'll just look at you like you're crazy because they don't care what our style guidelines are, right? Yeah. <laughs> so just, don't con just don't confuse your uh, consumers, that's all. So mm -hmm. is that when you go to places like that, you just have to call, you know, if you want something that, you know, dark, strong, just call about what the name of the beer is versus, like, the yep. style. Right, right. Yep. Just and if you go a, to a... Stick yeah. a number in there, six, eight, twelve. That, that's going to mean something to them, right? I mean, it seems like all the, all the breweries use a numbering code to determine their strength. Yeah, and actually, if you go to a pub in, in the U.K., on all the hand pumps, you walk into a pub, there'll be a, you know, a bank of these hand pulls against the bar, right? And they'll all have like a little hang tag on the front of them that kind of tells you what the brewery is, a little description of the beer, and, you know, what the ABV is, what, you know, some little description of the beer. I mean, Camera, which is the campaign for real ale, oh. has done a fantastic job of educating uh, pubs in England for how to present their beer, at least. Well, I, I want to talk just... I, I know we've talked about this in other um, sessions, but I want to talk about water, because water seems to be pretty specific to this style, uh, Burton on a Trent. And we talked about hard water with a high sulfate content. How does a home brewer here in the United States um, that wants to try and brew something in this style achieve water um, or, or achieve that English pale, those those characters, uh, characteristics, without you know, doing some chemistry? Isn't, oh, well, isn't there, I forget which company, but there's a, one of the Midwest Northern Brewer big home brewing companies sells like a uh, Burton on Trent uh, like a water kit to kind of try to simulate, um, simulate that that water profile. I know yeah. um, L LD Carlson, one of them. Uh, I don't know distributors brands that you see out there with a lot of homebrew supplies. They actually have a two ounce or one ounce packet of Burton on Trenton minerals or salts, and they call it water that salt. packet is. Right, and that packet is good for a five-gallon batch of whatever you. I mean, I guess the, the, end but, of the end, it also depends on what you're starting, while starting with. Yeah, you got to know where you're starting from. Yeah. No, yeah, right, right, and and the and the goal is, I feel like the goal of that particular that pack is if you have a blank canvas, 
like RO water. Yes. So that's the great thing about it here. Minerals in RO water, you need to add it. You need to add stuff into it to get to where you want to go. Whether it be a, you know replicating Dublin or replicating Burton on Trent or replicating something in Belgium or Dallas, Texas, whatever. You know what I mean? So I feel like. That's what they want. They they assume the home brewer has that clean slate, and hey, we have a packet for you if you want to make a water profile that's similar to or quote unquote exactly like Burn on Trent. That's the great yeah. thing about it here is the, the the local water authority had gotten a lot of inquiries from home brewers in the area, and there's I think seven or eight main sources of water in the Roanoke Valley area here, and they've added a listing on their website so you can get all the key uh, profiles or the levels of all the main you know the sulfites and all of that so you can you know where your water is so you can uh, you know, adjust well, it accordingly. So but the problem is if it's if it's uh, the Roanoke City Water Company who chlorinates their water, that's the last thing you want to use. That's true. <laughs> yeah. I mean I actually I would say don't obsess too much about the water. If you have good tasting water and you're getting making good beer out of it, tinkering with your water chemistry is probably the last little bit that you want to do to take a beer from being, you know, like a top 30s to like a low 40s beer. I mean, it's it's an in, intangible that kind of kicks it over the top, but you can make a really great beer without messing around too much so, uh, you with your water chemistry. What about brewing with mineral water or just spring water? Well, again, but, uh, spring water depends on what the spring is. Yeah, where the spring. Is. I mean, yeah, here in here in Indiana, we have really hard alkaline water. So if you go like, to the, there's a park over here where you can go and get some artesian well water. It makes fantastic brown ales and stouts. Makes terrible pale ales. Uh, I wouldn't say terrible, but they're kind of soapy and the hop character is kind of muted. Um, I would say, so I don't use it to make that. I start with RO and just add a little bit of brewing salts to get some enough minerals for the yeast to be happy uh, in it. So it all depends on what you're starting with. I mean, you can make dark beers with pretty much any sort of water. What all right, this? what other kind of things do we need to cover on the styles what? themselves as far as judging and tasting? What is this? What, what is this thing? Uh -oh. What is thing? People are they're, uh, turning yeah, off the cameras. Yeah, I, I was trying to turn the Q&A thing on, and I accidentally bumped the capture. Oh, oh okay. Nice okay. to take screenshots. Don't let that confuse anybody. It's right next to the Q&A. I just wanted to check. <laughs> yeah, maybe one of the things that would be helpful is if we kind of talked about what kind of distinguishes English pale ales from, like, American pale ales. I mean, it's mostly ingredients, right? Um, and typic and really, it's kind of, you know, the combination of the base malt. American pale ales will use something like a two-row uh, pale malt, which is kind of just grainy, straightforward, uh, malty. Uh, whereas your English base malts have a little bit more toasty, biscuity character to them, like your Maris Otter or... Um, Simpsons Golden Promise is a Scottish one that a lot of people use to make Scottish ales. Um, oh, yeah, that's great stuff. Um, and then, you know, you've got your uh, your crystal malts, which even to me taste different than American crystal malts. I mean, if you get, like, you know, just go into your homebrew store and grab a little handful of some Simpsons Dark Crystal and some, you know, just Bryce C60 or something and compare them. Between the two, I think you get a little bit more of that dark toffee raisiny character off of all the English crystal malts than you do off the American ones. That kind of contributes to the darker color that you see uh, in the finished beer. And then you've got your uh, English hops, which are more of the kind of herbal, uh, grassy, uh, pine. They're not piney. More pine uh, Yeah, earthy, more herbal, earthy. Yeah, that's a good. That's, that's a good description. Earthy. And um, watch out for the uh, the one that everybody talks about is the old cat pee. You know, just sometimes if you over hop the thing and over dry hop, you will get you know that they they you know everybody talks about the cat pee, the litter box smell. It just is not 
you know, pleasant about some of the EKGs and some of the other English pops. Yeah, to me, EKG, if you put too much in it, it almost tastes like metallic or bloody to it. I mean, I don't care for overhopping with that one, but... Mm, I love that hop. It's it, great in <laughs> limited quantities. <laughs> I guess we all have our own. I think it's just an elegant hop. That's all. It is. Oh, this is terrible. This is terrible. And Dave says, "I love." I don't understand the term (laughs) over hop. Well, I'll I'll say one one for me that is more amateur in this. One thing that I notice for me that is different between American pale ales and uh, English is it seems that the English one is more fruity. There's more fruitiness to it. That's the yeast. That's the that's the most difference that I found between the two. That's the pretty east. character. So that's that's one thing we didn't talk about and we've done a number of experiments on our own club as well as uh, sample a lot of the UK beers and yeast is a big component. It, it's you know you take a typical US pale ale is, is maybe using 1056. It's a very neutral yeast. And but in the UK there's a a number of good yeast that give you a lot of esters or they give you other qualities that uh, are unique to particular breweries. Uh, you know, they're, uh, I, I, I forget the which yeast numbers go with which breweries, but they're, they really are distinctive. And so picking the right yeast there is, is kind of a key. They're, they're not temperature sensitive, but they will respond to the temperature that you're um, running your ferment at. So one of the things that people kind of think that ales are kind of like set it and forget it kind of beers, you have to watch out. You get a lot of biological heat built up if you get a very vigorous fermentation. So if you're using a lot of sugars and that type of thing, you might have this thing kick off and you know, in just one day it might raise itself five degrees, which will kick off a lot more esters than you might have been expecting. And another time you do it, just a slightly slower fermentation, all of a sudden it's like, what happened to my esters? You know, I, I don't understand why, where did that go to. So, even though we need to think that, you know, oh, ales are pretty simple, you just, you know, ferment them, there is a lot that can be said for temperature control, just maintaining what you're trying to shoot yep. for as far as temperature and keeping good notes. And and the pitching rate is, is key, too. Um, you pitch a, a, a smaller amount of yeast, the cells have to grow up to absorb all of the uh, oxygen and uh, use up the lipids. And during that time, they're generating esters. But if you pitch a lot of yeast, then they uh, very quickly uh, get to fermentation and you're not generating as many esters. So that's one way to, to um, either have a fruitier beer or a cleaner beer. One one of the one of the yeast I thought was kind of interesting. So I talked to John Mayer. I was kind of surprised. Pac-Man. I got to brew a couple of beers with Rogue, and uh, I didn't realize it was based on an English uh, yeast strain. And they brought it in it because everybody knows it as being this incredibly clean uh, yeast. But if you put it in a very subtle beer, you know, very uh, small beer, it'll strip it of all the dextrins. It's amazing how that thing will just like come in there and take over the neighborhood and uh, steal the remote and everything else. It's it's really a, a highly attenuated yeast, but what's interesting about that is if you're not careful, uh, because the yeast drops out so quickly and because it chews everything up, it will also kick out a lot of diacetyl. So you have to be careful about temperatures you're fermenting at, giving the, the beer time uh, on the yeast because one of the big mistakes that people make with uh, English ales is they think that, oh, it's done fermenting, it's time to tr- transfer it, and you basically steal all the yeast cells that are going to reabsorb the diacetyl. Yeah, so people are too too anxious to too anxious to transfer when the bubbling stops, huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and one thing to point out is, you know, most beer styles do not allow any diacetyl if you read the style guidelines. These English pale ales are some of the few that allow a low amount of diacetyl. The Scottish one's also a little bit. Um, I mean, very, very little. Almost imperceptible, but it's just because the yeast tend to throw a little bit of it, and many of the English cask ales tend to fall out. They are very highly flocculent, as we would say. They fall out of solution very fast. So they don't 
finish up their job completely. And there's one strain that throws a lot of green apple too. Uh, so what we would call all flavor and aroma called acid aldehyde, which is like the green apple rind. Uh, if you get a Samuel Smith's in the bottle, you'll you can probably taste it. Well, one thing I was going to say um, when we're talking about yeast contact time and giving the yeast time to do its do its thing, I did a talk last week for the Georgia Brewers Guild, and one of the things that was kind of interesting when you start researching it. Essentially, there's a lot of uh, diacetyl precursors. One is AAL, which essentially the, the quick diacetyl check that you would do of your beer is you would stress test it and heat it up to 160 degrees and just see after uh, 15 minutes and you cool it back down if you're getting any diacetyl in there. That's to test with precursors. But essentially, every um, um, packaging brewery, if, you, if diacetyl leaves in your beer, it will never go down, and it will most likely go up as the beer ages. That's just the way it is. It, it, you can't fight gravity as far as that. So you can have diacetyl in your beer, just realize it may increase. And I was just at the uh, World Beer Cup working, uh, you know, working the contest as part of the staff, and I kid you not, every every session there were two, three, five, maybe as many as a half a dozen beers that had diacetyl. Here are world-class brewers sending the beer in you know, for a contest. They obviously tried to put the best foot forward. And here they were still packaging beers and they ended up with uh, diacetyl. Way over the top. So one thing, uh, back to judging these a little bit too, The um, when I'm judging uh, this particular style, you'll get, you typically get entries in each of the subcategories, right? And so you, you start out with the lighter ones, you move towards the, the stronger ones. And so some of the criteria, you, you look for the technical faults and all of those things, you look for balance. Um, but how do you differentiate, you know, somebody that enters a beer that is a, it enters as an ordinary, but it's really a, an extra special, you know, it's, it's a bigger beer. Well. You typically are going to be, you're going to knock it on probably alcohol. You're going to sense more alcohol. You're going to sense a bigger mouthfeel uh, in in those beers, right? And so that's one one thing is is in judging them, you're kind of differentiating those which are really balanced at the low end, and those that are balanced in the middle, and those that are balanced at the high end. And when they're unbalanced because they've got uh, too much alcohol and a real light body, that doesn't work. Or too much alcohol and um, at, at, it's supposed to be a, at the low end or maybe even at the high end, you know, it's, it's too sweet, it's, uh, it's not bitter enough. Those kind of things really start to, mm -hmm. to pick and choose between which is a good representative of style and those which are not. And those that are out of style, you know, it's, it's, it's a good beer but it's a little too big. It's not really an ordinary bitter. This is really a uh, maybe the high end of special bitter or something. And there's there is overlap in the numbers, so it's not like it's a clear demarcation. Uh, somebody could enter the same one in, in both and do well in both. But yeah, I think that's a good point, Dave. I mean, they're they're balanced beers, but it's just increasing in size of the yep. beer, right? They should be almost perfectly balanced at each level, right? So you imagine that you have a 3.5% beer that has just enough hops to make it a little bit bitter, but you still got a strong malt presence, and then just kind of move it up a little bit, then you've got, you know, your special bitter, and then you move it up a little bit more, and you've got your extra special bitter. So as you're increasing the malt character, because you're increasing the OG, you're increasing the hops right. at each point to balance that out. So... It is just a continuum, right? It's just like this is a little beer. This is the slightly bigger version of that beer. This is the biggest version of that beer. Well, the biggest version is actually the English IPA, but um, they're all very well balanced. So even though you know an ESB has something like you know 50 IBUs, it still starts off with an OG somewhere around 10, 50 or so. So it's still about as balanced as the ordinary bitter is. Yep. It's just more flavor. More alcohol, more malt, more hops. 
More everything. More everything, yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, uh, you judges, and the, what other kind of things do you think we need to work in here um, to to prepare folks for the BJCP, for being able to judge this style? I mean, I think Agatha really kind of lays it out there. You want a balance between the malt and the hop. You don't want, you know, you want you want things to be subdued, but you want them to be present, right? So, I mean, mm-hmm. that's that's where this thing is. This isn't a, there. This not a hop bomb or a malt bomb or something that that really presents itself in those in that big a way. Um, and and you will have Matt. You will have fruit bombs too. You'll have super esprit beers. You know, I mean, just that's just what happens. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, get, the, the best thing to prepare is uh, get those tickets and uh, head to London, Manchester, York. And work the pumps, huh? Work yeah. The pumps, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> What's on the pumps? Let's just start. Let's all head down to the Winchester and wait for this whole thing to blow over, right? So. I'm going to Europe next year, and I'm hoping to maybe meet uh, Simon Martins. I see. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. One, of our, one of our good friends that does a, a beer review every day from Wales. <laughs> and I think what three years now? I think he's got he's got more than a thousand beers under his belt in the last. Oh no, year. yeah, he celebrated a thousand. Was in the middle next last. Year. Yeah, yeah. He knows, <laughs> to, he knows how to drink. Yeah, he's known to put down a few. <laughs> uh, what, what's great is he reviews like three or four at a time. So like the fourth one, he's just <laughs> completely out of his mind, you know. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> there's a little shout out to our good friend. Uh, yeah. Well, that is, uh, I, I think that probably wraps it. Does anybody disagree? All right. Nope. Uh, I think we've covered English pale ales. Someone helped me prep. I didn't look at, ahead to see what category nine is. What's category nine? It's Scottish. Right. Scottish. Scottish. Oh, Scottish. All right. So Scottish ales is going to be our next style. That's category nine, and that is in two weeks. So we will be back with that. Uh, in the meantime, you can download this as a Stitcher podcast from uh, you know Stitcher, iTunes, uh, FeedBurner. You can check us out on craftbeernation.org, O-R-G. Uh, that's where a lot of the stuff is. We're at Craft Beer, the community on Google Plus with, like, what do we have as of today, 11 or 11,500 members? So it's it's oh, a pretty wow. pretty active almost, place. Almost seventeen, eleven seven. Eleven seven, getting close. So wow. uh, so a lot of a lot of fun stuff happening there, and then uh, I, our YouTube channels where this this will land immediately. So uh, we're everywhere. We're everywhere you want to be. So join us, uh, and 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 I, I again I always thank, but I I thank extremely um, Phil Farrell making an effort to come out here and you know land in plane safely and then coming. <laughs> And then coming over here to, to talk beer with us okay. and Dave Hausman. And Matt, I wouldn't have been here. I wouldn't have been here. I would have been flying back up from Rio, but uh, <laughs> I uh, unfortunately got uh, one of those 24-hour bugs, so I, uh, I'm here now. So I, I see you're flushing that, that right out of your system, though, so that's good. <laughs> let's, get, let's get on no, the other side. This is the first yeah. day I've been able to hold down solid food, so it's great. Oh, no kidding. Oh, wow. Well, I'm that's glad tough. you're better. I'm glad you're better, and I'm glad you're with us, because honestly, if I had to choose between flying back from Rio and hanging out with you six guys drinking beer, I'd, well, no, that might be a push. That might be a push. <laughs> I was in London last week, and I'll be in London next week, so it's fun. <laughs> oh, there you go. Now, then you definitely can give us a report from the pumps. We've got uh, David Hausman, always a joy to have you with us, and Agatha Feldus, we look forward to having you join us whenever you can. Um, for Craft Beer Nation, for Alan, Ashley, Boris, Doug, Gil, and myself, um, we are, we're glad to be here, and we're looking forward to doing this stuff again in the future. So uh, I say with the end of the little beer that I have left in my glass, I say cheers. 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 cheers.